Thanks so much, Melissa and Yayo. Hello, everyone. So great to have you. Very busy time. Uh, we uh, expect people will continue to join us throughout the evening. We had quite a few people register. Um, but as I said, it's busy times and lots of debates happening. And uh, there's a uh, an air quality warning. So I hope you are all staying healthy and safe and happy pride and happy Indigenous History Month. So welcome to our event. We're really excited to be hosting some wonderful guest speakers. And this session is about talking about our second chance for a better city in search of Toronto's next mayor. And this event alongside Social Planning Toronto is brought to you by the Show Up TO campaign, a partnership between us, YWCA Toronto, Women Act, and the City for All platform partners. So thanks so much for taking time to join us today. I am Jin Ha, Executive Director of Social Planning Toronto. We're a nonprofit charitable organization whose mission is to challenge inequity in our city through knowledge generation, debate, civic engagement, advocacy, and collaboration to spark social and policy change. So this by-election is unique. In addition to it being our second chance to elect Toronto's mayor within a year, there is no incumbent and only one position on the ballot. So all eyes are solely focused on the top role on city council. Toronto mayors hold significant power to shape the city but they're all still just one vote on council, although that's not the full picture anymore with new strong mayor powers. With so many names in the mix, 102 candidates at final count, we as voters have a difficult decision to make this election. Our city is facing multiple crises and emergencies. The ongoing effects of the COVID pandemic are exacerbating existing inequalities and having long-standing impacts on our communities. Food bank use is rising at never before seen rates, as is homelessness. Our social system is breaking due to a crisis in affordability, especially in housing and mental health and addictions. The impacts of the climate crisis and the failing transit system are borne by those that have the least power. Meanwhile, our city infrastructure is literally crumbling. Each year, City Council must respond to service needs at the expense of maintaining and repairing critical infrastructure uh, with insufficient revenue to rebuild our city. Over a decade of austerity budgets have led to critical underfunding of community programs and basic city services. And coming out of the pandemic, the city now faces a one and a half billion dollar deficit. Our next mayor, is faced with a set of serious challenges. And we have invited you here today to share some insights and perspectives uh, with our guest speakers on the type of leader we need to build a better, more livable city for all. And to share some tips and resources to help you decide who to vote for as you head to the polls. Elections, particularly municipal elections, are especially important to us at Social Planning Toronto. In the fall, we saw the lowest voter turnout uh, uh, reach an all-time low, even for a municipal election, 29% of eligible voters. We see voting as an essential part of the democratic process and an opportunity for residents to participate in shaping the political agenda. This is one of the issues we'd like to also raise this evening. So before we invite our brilliant guest speakers to share their thoughts, I'd like to share some simple tips to help us all navigate through candidate platforms and promises. And this is courtesy of Matri Foundation. So to analyze candidate platforms and speeches, here's a bit of a helpful guide. Always keep looking. It's not always where it should be. Full platforms aren't always released early in campaigns. And if you're looking for a po particular policy issue, it may not be available yet. Look at media releases on candidate websites and social media announcements. Secondly, distinguish between critiques and commitments or promises. Platforms often have a mix of text that includes commitments uh, of candidates if they're elected, as well as critiques of their opponents. And so in debates and in social media, if you see a candidate they're critiquing another candidate. Also make sure that you look at what their commitments are. Are they engaging meaningfully on the issue themselves? Or is this critique full of targeted attacks and sound bites? How do their commitments compare on this issue? 
how do they listen and engage and the way that they are speaking and talking about their commitments and approaching their critiques are these the qualities you want in Toronto's mayor pay attention to the details are the details specific enough will something truly be implemented and if yes when uh, is it intended to be funded? And if yes, how was this previously announced and already promised? And are they just riding off the coattails of past uh, uh, promises? And question the language that they use. There often isn't common agreement on terms. For example, affordable housing is a key one. When a candidate speaks about affordable housing, what do they mean by affordable? Is it an income-based definition, as many of us have argued for? or is it based on the average market rent? So for example, 80% of the current market rent, which is likely way too high for an out of reach for many Torontonians. So diving deeper will help you determine if they are committed to deeply affordable housing. And then unpack their perspectives. Who are they serving? What experiences are they speaking from? For example, around public and community safety, who are they talking about? Safety for whom? What are their assumptions about what leads to violence and crime and how to fix these? How, have you seen evidence that their approach works in the past? And what experience are they speaking from? And then next slide, as you dive deeper, here's some questions for you to consider as you look at each of the platforms. Um, what is actually meant by so going deeper and asking for example in terms of stakeholders who are their stakeholders are they talking about residents about us are they talking about businesses about homeowners or renters trying to figure out who their key stakeholder group is and who is mostly affected by the issues that they're speaking about and their promises and their commitments who will that benefit how will it harm or benefit us or you and your communities and when can we expect these changes that they're promising to happen? Are they talking about new programs and policies where significant new investments have to be found? How will it be funded? Is it new funding? And then finally, what is the candidate's track record on delivering on these promises in the past and fighting for this initiative in the past? Have they made progress in the past? Have they made promises and not really followed through? Have they voted for or against this issue in the past? So those are just some quick and dirty tips for you to sort through all the different candidates. And then our guest speakers are going to provide some additional insight today. Sorting through 102 platforms is no easy feat. So we hope these, hope these tips help you in your decision, in addition to the conversation this evening. Final tip. Um, here's some folks that we turn to who have expertise in these different issue areas. We will have all of this posted on our website. Folks are uh, working on different campaigns related to different issues and are asking candidates to commit to their platforms. So we'll share a bit more info at the end of this session. Uh, and of course, there's the Show Up TO campaign that we're a part of, the City for All platform. And then you can always look at our uh, election fact sheets as well as past City Budget Watch blog posts about different issue areas. So now to our brilliant guest speakers, I would like you to come on camera and I'm going to introduce them one at a time, starting with Heather Dorries, who is an assistant professor, jointly appointed to the Department of Geography and Planning and the Center for Indigenous Studies at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on the dynamic interplay between resurgent Indigenous world making and the violence of settler colonial urbanization. Specifically, it examines how settler colonialism as a mode of racial capitalism is supported by planning processes. It also considers how indigenous intellectual traditions, including indigenous environmental knowledge, legal orders, and cultural production can be applied to anti-colonial planning practices and develops the theoretical and methodological frameworks this transformation requires. That all sounds really exciting and smart. So Heather, please come on video and answer our warm up question, which is what are three words that describe what you love most about Toronto? Heather. Oh, thanks um, for that great introduction. Um, so three words, really hard to pick three words because there's so many great things about Toronto, but I would say food, um, lively streets, 
and Lake Ontario. Thanks. That is lovely. And we will let you squeeze in that extra word, no problem. So next I wanna introduce Debbie Douglas, who is the Executive Director of OCASI, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants. Through her work in the NGO sector and particularly at OCASI, Debbie has highlighted issues of equity and inclusion, including race, gender, and sexual orientation within the immigration system, and promoted the creation of safe, welcoming spaces within the settlement and integration sector. She was a member of the Government of Ontario's Expert Panel on Immigration, which published the report Roots to Success that led to the province's first immigration legislation in 2015. And she is the recipient of several awards, including the Women of Distinction from YWCA Toronto, which she had a conflict with today, and she's still here with us, so we really appreciate that. The Amino Malco Award from the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture, and the Urban Alliance on Race Relations Anti-Racism Award. Welcome, Debbie. Please come on video and answer our warm-up question. Three words that describe what you love most about Toronto. Oh, very difficult. I would say... Um culture, Caribana, beaches. Love it. Love the broad and the specific. Wonderful. So next time I'm going to introduce you to Jennifer Hollett, who is the exec executive director at The Walrus, Canada's Conversation. The Walrus is known for its award-winning independent journalism, fact-checking, and national ideas focused events. Prior to this role, Jennifer was the head of news and government at Twitter Canada and has worked as a host, reporter, and producer with CBC, CTV, and much music. She has her master in public administration from Harvard Kennedy School. Jennifer served on the board of directors at Social Planning Toronto and Toronto Environmental Alliance and helped raise 74,000 in student scholarships with media girlfriends. Jennifer, welcome. What are your three words? I've heard a couple of them already, so I'll go with new words. People, Toronto's all about the people, and we have such a diverse range of, of people bringing just like all their, their backgrounds and passions and experiences. Art, it was a commitment I made coming out of lockdown to see as much art and there's so much art to take in in the city and walkability. I can walk just about everything where I live in downtown East and uh, I hope we can develop that for more neighborhoods. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And last but not least, Inari Roy is a Toronto-based journalist and associate editor at The Local, an online magazine covering social issues and urban health. She has previously written for the Toronto Star, CBC, and environmental publications, The Narwhal and Unearth. She specializes in data journalism and long-form investigative writing on issues related to inequity, urban infrastructure, health, labor and climate and has developed the locals 2022 and the 2023 election coverage particularly through their candidate tracker Inori, please come on video what are your three words hey there thanks for having me um my three words i have heard a couple of them as well uh, i'm gonna repeat food because the food is just so good and and um so plentiful um i'd say my other two words are uh, variety because i feel like you can access any version of the city that you want to live in. Um, there's so much to offer and, and depending on what you're looking for and, and what kind of life you want to live, there's everything you could possibly need. Um, though I do fear that that's being threatened more and more every day. Um, and the third one I'd have to say is potential. Um, I actually haven't been living in Toronto that long, just a few years now. Uh, before this, I, you know, have been all over for, for university and for work and um, I grew up in Mississauga and I just feel like Toronto is the place where I can envision the most for my own future and, and the futures of so many people I know and, and I think that that potential and possibilities is really beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, potential is such a great segue into the next part of the evening. So now we're going to ask questions of each of our four guest speakers, and we'll uh, give them an opportunity to speak to each of the questions that we're asking. So the first question that we're going to start with, and we'll we'll turn to Heather first on this one, is based on your area of expertise, 
or the perspective of your key stakeholder group, what are the biggest issues facing Toronto and what kind of change is needed? Huge question. So Heather, from your urban planning um, and Indigenous sports perspective uh, in the, the urban environment, do you want to speak to this question first? Yeah, um, thanks so much. So um, so I'm of, of mixed Anishinaabe and settler descent, and I'm a member of Seguin First Nation and Treaty One. But I just also want to make clear that I'm sharing my individual perspective here, and I'm not speaking on behalf of any specific Indigenous peoples or nation. I think this is a really important question because even though it might not always be evident in the same way it might be in Winnipeg or Saskatoon or Vancouver, Toronto has a really large and vibrant and diverse Indigenous community. And while there's a concentration of institution, Indigenous institutions on Spadina and on the east side of downtown, there are Indigenous people all over the city. And I think that's important to remember. And, you know, every part of the city, this city is on the traditional territories of Indigenous people. So there's no place where this question isn't relevant. I think one other thing to think about the um, Indigenous people in Toronto is that there are many different people here, many people from different nations, different parts of the country. Um, and when we're talking about Indigenous people, we're talking about children, youth, elders, two-spirit and LGBTQ plus people um, who are also dispersed throughout the city. Um, and so it's such a diverse population, many of the same things that are of concern for Indigenous people are also like just things that are of general concern for people. Um, but more specifically for uh, Indigenous people, I think, you know, a lot of Indigenous people in Toronto are experiencing challenges related to being low income, um, with experiencing homelessness. Some studies have suggested that approximately 35% of Indigenous adults in Toronto experience homelessness or precarious housing. Um, and then finally, as a, as a group of people who are often racial, racialized, I think Indigenous people also tend to experience issues related to racism or tend to be targeted for over-policing. So the, the concerns of, the, of Indigenous people, I think, are, are really broad. Um, in 2022, the City of Toronto released a reconciliation Reconciliation Action Plan, which is one of the ways that the city was responding to the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And I think this was a really important step and uh, is something that's really important to continue. The commitments that were made by the city in this plan include things related to um, returning land to Indigenous governments, communities, collectives, and organization. And this includes, right now, includes things like um, placekeeping and more involvement in the management of Toronto parks. Uh, it involved these commitments involve making financial response reparations and right now this is focused largely on encouraging Indigenous economic development. And then finally they've made a set of commitments that are focused on ways that Indigenous peoples might be more involved in decision making processes in the city. And I think those are all really important and I think it's like that this just was came out in 2022. So we're, we're at the very beginning of a process. And I think it's really important to see that process continue. And then finally, I'll say, you know, I, it's really important to recognize that when we're talking about how the city might address the concerns and needs of Indigenous peoples, we're ultimately often talking about addressing institutional and systemic racism. And so even though anti-Indigenous racism arises out of a specific historic and political context. Addressing systemic racism is something that's gonna benefit many Torontonians, right? Whether it's people who are over-policed, whether it's people, talk, we're talking about confronting racism in the housing market or uh, people experiencing mental health, health or other crises. Like these are things that I, I think will benefit everyone. So um, I think that's why it's important to, to emphasize, um, you know, emphasize this as an important part of, um, you know, what, what our city can do and what leadership might do. Thanks.
That's great, Heather. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to diving into some of the details of what we hope for from the next mayor on some of these uh, some of these issues. So, Debbie, uh, can you speak next to what you think based on your perspective or your stakeholder group, your key state stakeholder group? What are the biggest issues facing the city and what kind of change is needed? Sure, and thank you. And as Heather was speaking, I thought we're going to have lots of overlap in the conversation we're having in terms of what some of the priorities are. As I think about um, the migrant uh, residents, immigrants and refugees, but also for me, the um, black community, uh, many of what Heather talked about um, really resonates. Um, I think that the city has been on a journey to recognize its role um, in immigration um, about just about almost two decades now, the Toronto Newcomer Office was set up um, to engage on the issue of new of new arrivals to Toronto and how the city um, and the role of the city um, in supporting their successful um, journey um, as new arrivals in the in the city. Um, what we are finding now is that there are there is a significant um, houselessness um, issue, particularly with refugee um, claimants, um, but, but other refugees and, and, and migrants. Um, and we know that the majority of new uh, folks arriving here in the city, but throughout the country, um, are racialized. Um, so issues of racism, issues of racism in rental um, property, where we often hear, um, and in fact, over the last two years, some of you may remember there are ads in uh, newspapers uh, for housing in Mississauga is one I'm, I'm remembering now where they were blatantly saying no Blacks need apply. And this was in 2021, 2022. Um, so anti-Black racism is certainly alive and well in the city of Toronto. Um, the, about eight years ago, the city started a conversation with Black communities looking back 30, over 30 years of recommendations on anti-Black racism. Um, and that work led to the creation of the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit um, at the City of Toronto. Um, any new mayor will, it, this is certainly something we would be looking for the new mayor to support. Um, but in terms of um, what's, um, top, what's top of mind, um, immigrants and refugees are no different from other Torontonians. Um, housing and affordable housing. Um, and when I say affordable, I mean anywhere, but no one paying more than 30% of their income. Um, to housing, I think is what um, some of you call deep affordability, is certainly um, top of mind. Um, whether or not we're talking about new families um, starting out, whether or not they're sole support parents or um, parents in two, two parent families, um, seniors, um, housing is a critical issue. Um, the city needs to get back into building housing. The city needs to look at some of the successes we've had in the past with co-op housing, um, with partnering um, between the various levels of government and with interested community groups who can build um, on behalf of their own residents. Um, I believe it was in the early 1990s, I was involved with a group where we built housing in Scarborough for sole support um, mothers um, who, who were able then to be head of households um, in, in a co-op in Scarborough that's still going um, very strong. Public transit public transit, especially in the Northeast and the Northwest um, areas of our city. Um, we, 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 we know that for many folks who live in North Etobicoke, as an example, it takes hours to get to work um, because of the lack of rapid transit. Same thing in Scarborough, in areas of Scarborough. We've watched the debate about a, a subway in Scarborough. We've watched the city and our councillors do away with a fun, fully funded rapid transit plan. And years and years later, there is nothing. Who are the people in those areas? Black and brown folks and immigrants and refugees. Um, these, these, are, these are key, key issues. We've watched the Eglinton um, LRT go on for over 12 years, especially in the West End. The communities that have been affected have been immigrant and refugee communities, have been black communities who have seen their businesses go on the ground. The housing that was affordable, that sits on top of those street level businesses have all been lost as, 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 the, sub, as, the, 
um, rapid transit is getting built, when it's getting built, um, we are seeing those areas um, become gentrified and housing that was once affordable, we're seeing those communities break up. Um, it is ironic that the city has been paying much attention to little Jamaica um, in the Dufferin, Eglinton, Oakwood area. Um, there is a very good chance that by the time the LRT is completed, there will be no black folks living in little Jamaica because it will become unaffordable. And so the city needs to pay attention to how it is it is supporting those small businesses. Many are single proprietor businesses, they're hairdressers, they're barbers, they're restaurants. These are the kinds of things we need to pay attention to. Um, affordable amenities, um, being able to pay for garbage pickup and, and water without seeing those costs um, continue, continuously um, es escalating. There is so much I can talk about food sovereignty. Um, and food security. There are, we have so many communities, um, again, especially outside of the downtown core, where there are food deserts. We need to pay attention in terms of how people are accessing healthy foods. Um, so, so that, and, and, and now we're seeing the significant inflation in foods in terms of buy, being able to buy fruits and vegetables and, and, and meat. That has always been true for, for many families. Imagine now with the inflation um, rates that we're seeing, how difficult it is. The City of Toronto has um, put in place, Council adopted, a Black sovereignty food um, policy. We would want to see that continues and we would want to see that ex ex expanded across other communities. Um, so affordable housing, public transit, food security, support for the most marginalized around us, addressing issues of racism, including the over-policing of black and racialized and immigrant and refugee communities, all are key issues for us going forward and something I'm paying attention to in terms of the front leaders in this race. That's great, thanks Debbie. A great overview of some of the critical issues and also some great concrete examples of how that's playing out. So Jennifer, what are the biggest issues and what kind of change is needed? Sure, so I'll speak from a national perspective. The Walrus, we strive to be Canada's conversation and we have a lot of readers here in the city, but also people taking a look at Toronto and cities at large from across the country. So I wanna share, I always like to bring props. This is our, our cover and actually it features Torontonians and I think it captures the diversity, but also the hustle and bustle and the movement in the city. And what we've seen from our stories to our events to conversations we're having now that we're back in person connecting is there's great interest in climate as it relates to a city like Toronto. We're all breathing that reality right now and tasting it. And I think realizing that this is gonna become more frequent. Uh, we saw in the pandemic how important health and public health is to cities and leadership and how that connects to the pandemic or the next pandemic, uh, but so, so many issues in the city and what it means and takes to keep a city healthy. The housing crisis, as mentioned, public transit as well. Uh, we have found, we tend to cover stories about public transit not working. That's a common story. We had a feature recently on the LRT in, in Ottawa and, and the problems there. And the uh, city should be leading on public transit. We recently did an event in Toronto on the idea of a new city, building vibrant, strong cities. And I think citizens are passionate on figuring that out, that we have an opportunity to lead with our cities, not just in Canada, but perhaps be a role model for around the world. There's potential there, back to that key word, how can we unlock that? And I would say a final point that isn't limited to a national point of view is the polarization of politics. I think there's a concern that that's starting to play out here in Toronto on the streets, uh, but also at city council and um, with who we elect. And that is, is dangerous. Ultimately, in a healthy democracy, we can all have different opinions and we can express those through debate through journalism, through elections, uh, but we're seeing that there is a growing divide and that's being played up by certain candidates as well as the media. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It's great to have that national perspective brought in. And Inori is gonna take us more local uh, from her perspective on the local. What are your thoughts on the, the biggest, biggest issues facing Toronto and the solutions needed? 
Yeah, so we had to do this exercise very purposefully when we were deciding what platform issues to um, to give space to in the candidate tracker. So uh, for context, candidate tracker is the locals um, democracy tool that we use uh, to inform our readers about the uh, both the, the biographical details and the uh, platform points um, of the different people running for mayor. So we have a team of researchers and fact checkers who go through and um, research all 102 candidates who are running for mayor and write uh, biographies and uh, short biographies and platforms for them. So in um, the, the platform section, some of the key issues that we we're highlighting have been mentioned already. So um, you know, affordable housing and uh, rights for uh, for renters. I think that's a really big one. Is that when we talk about, um, you know, the the recourse available to people who are renting in the city and the the growing sort of disproportionality in terms of renters' rights when compared to uh, the rights of homeowners uh, and the space they're given at the table to have conversations around affordability. Um, we've also, you know, we've seen at a provincial level that um, rights for renters are. Uh, decreasing, especially during the pandemic with the um, wait times at the landlord tenant board, uh, where renters were having to wait disproportionately longer to have their uh, cases heard in front of the judge compared to landlords, um, and had, you know, in the time that they were waiting for those rights were instead just being pushed out by more and more hostile living conditions. Um, so, you know, it's been great to see uh, some candidates have explicit like rental rights and renters rights uh, in their platforms. Um, another key thing that we uh, want to talk about is the sort of way that conversations around public safety are being had. Um, so one of the key things that we've written about in the past is the erosion in the provision and quality of public transit and how the attention now being diverted to the sort of um, the specter of lack of safety on public transit, you know, serves primarily as a means to, to make people not want to take transit more. Um, and that sort of becomes part of this vicious cycle of like a, a lower level of ridership and thus lower levels of funding, funding gaps in transit provision, which then leads to cuts to service. And that cycle goes um, around and around. Um, and so part of what needs to happen in the way that um, public safety is addressed on transit involves, you know, better social supports overall. Um, and that's something our readers uh, you know, care quite strongly about. We've written about over-policing um, and the policing of specific communities and the disproportionate funding provided to policing in comparison to social services like public transit. And so I'm one of the things that I look out for when I'm reading a platform is, you know, how much is the conversation around public safety based in actual trends, actual facts, versus um, creating a sense of fear that then legitimizes you know an increase in, in policing and police funding for example and so yeah. that the, the the careful yeah the 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 care with which that conversation is had is is very important um and then lastly just echoing the points on um the environment and on the pandemic so in terms of of environmental policy there's actually been shockingly little said by a lot of um a lot of candidates about the environmental policies in the city the city has a, a set of really ambitious goals for their climate policies, but um, has never sort of uh, put their money where their mouth is. There hasn't been enough of a sort of uh, thought given to dedicated streams of funding um, and to how we're going to actually enact the goals that we set. So one of the key things we looked at before we found out that um, former Mayor Tory was leaving was the uh, the budget presented in January. And part of that was we looked at recent years uh, and this year's uh, in, uh, climate budgeting. Uh, and we found that overall the city said it was spending $2 billion this year on climate and climate related initiatives, which also includes the money that goes to things that don't directly affect the climate, but are indirectly part of like larger climate plans. Um, but also in previous net zero um, reports, the city has said that it requires six to $8 billion a year over the next 10 years in order to meet cli the climate goals that they've set, which means that they're ex the city is expecting that overall um, private citizens, businesses, and uh, private uh, the private sector are um, you know, going to be contributing the rest of the four to six billion that it would take to meet net zero goals um, over the next decade, uh, which seems unrealistic and, and not feasible. And so you know, being able to have concrete plans for funding for environmental policies is a really big one. And the last thing is the pandemic. It's, 
it's disappointing and shocking how little the pandemic is actually mentioned in, in platforms. Um, and do you get the sense sometimes that candidates are acting almost like it didn't happen and that it doesn't exist um, and that the effects aren't like ongoing, the pandemic isn't ongoing, which it is. And so, um, you know, our, the local was, you know, regarded for its, its pandemic coverage and our coverage, especially of communities that weren't necessarily um, part of them, like it reported or represented in the mainstream media. And so we're seeing these continued pandemic effects, both in terms of, um, the uh, economies in in you know sort of the inner suburbs and uh, businesses, uh, transit provision and ridership, uh, senses of community and and networks and and sense of you know having a, a city that cares for you and that you belong in, um, and none of those things have really recovered from the effects of the pandemic. And so it would be, and it is important to uh, have candidates speak more to those direct effects and how they're going to address them. That's great, Anori. So much to dive deeper into, uh, but some really great points. And I agree, very little said about pandemic recovery. So that's possibly something we can dive into along with all the other issues around transit and issues facing renters and around the lack of conversation around climate. Before we dive into the issues and get some you know, really interesting uh, advice from you or uh, insight on the different platforms, I wanted to first ask you each about the kinds of qualities that we would like to see in our new mayor. So what kind of leadership do you think is needed in order to address all these huge challenges and crises we've been talking about? Um, what do they need in order to be able to affect change with folks across the various political spectrum, um, given strong mayor powers uh, to use or not to use, and then also dealing with the debt and other orders of government um, and the severe mistrust of politicians that exist these days. So what kind of qualities would you like to see in the, the next mayor? Debbie, do you want to take us off, start us off with this one? Sure. I, I, I love questions like that, right? <laughs> what kind of mayor? Uh, someone who, who is bright? Uh, no, I think we need a, a mayor who comes in knowing that their eyes have to be on the margins, that all decisions must be for those who are most vulnerable in our city. Um, we need a mayor who puts people before wealth and influence. We need a mayor who will put Toronto first, and not be succumbed by the strong mayor powers to play to the provincial government. I'm trying very hard to remember that this is a nonpartisan space. Um, we, we need, but we also need a mayor that's bold. Um, I think that um, there is a sense that things are not working the way they should for the majority of people here in the city. And so we need a mayor who will come in and be able to listen, to hear what the issues are from the diversity of our communities, um, both geographically and demographically, right? And so I'm talking about um, refugee claimants and talking about queer folk. I'm talking about a mayor who will pay attention to the, the, the increasing violence against trans women, particularly trans women of color, um, and be having the, those conversations at the police services board. I'm uh, we, we need a mayor um, who sees themselves not only as a leader here in the city, but as a leader within the conversations that are happening with, in Ontario municipalities, a, a mayor um, who is influencing the national conversation on municipalities and the role of municipalities in some of the larger national issues that Jennifer alluded to. Um, we, need, we need a mayor who is out in communities, not only at the time of elections for photo op, but a mayor who is comfortable um, with, with all of Toronto's peoples. A mayor that not only shows up in June for pride, the, the year of an election, but a mayor who understands the queer folks who live down at church in Wellesley, but also the queer folk who live in Malvern and the differences in their experiences as being Torontonians. Um, we need a mayor who speaks truth to other levels of government. And we need a mayor who is savvy enough to recognize that Toronto and all of its responsibilities can only advance with the support of, 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 of other um, levels of government. We need a mayor who recognizes um, what we talked about, that seniors have such an important role to continue to play here in the city. And if we're talking about building healthy communities, it means that our seniors must be able to age in place 
So this has to be it has to be a mayor who can broker those conversations with other levels of government. We have a mayor who is coming in with an attitude of building that they are wanting to build deeply affordable housing that they're wanting to ensure that we have affordable public nonprofit daycare. We have a mayor who should be engaged in conversations about wages for daycare workers, a mayor who is looking at its own workforce at the city and ensuring that it looks like the face of the city, a mayor who seeing the billions of dollars in infrastructure dollars that we spend as a city ensures community benefits, ensures vendor policies that says that some of those dollars must go to women-headed firms, must go to racialized-headed firms, must go to smaller um, co contracting firms, and that, they, and, and that any city project must ensure that the folks who are hired to work at all levels of the, of the project look like the city of Toronto, racially, based on gender, and other considerations. So we, we need a mayor who's coming on to lead and to lead all of the people, not just to pay attention to developers and to the wealthy and those with influence. Wow, that was uh, amazing. Uh, I love how you started Eyes on the Margins and People Before Wealth, and it just continued to get better from there. So uh, Jennifer, what are your thoughts on the kind of leader we need? We need a lover and a fighter. We need someone who loves the city of Toronto and lives that minute to minute and someone who is ultimately a community builder and can bring people into community and communities together because we are stronger when we do that. But we also need a fighter. In 2018, Doug Ford, who is the premier of Ontario, but sometimes acts like he is the mayor of Toronto, he cut council in the middle of an election, in the middle of an election. And it also means we still don't have proper representation. So never mind candidates not mentioning the pandemic, which we're still in to your point, Anori. We also don't have proper representation. This would be like my hometown of St. Catharines having one councillor. <laughs> so other cities uh, across Ontario and Canada, proper representation, we don't. But all to say, we have seen a pattern from Doug Ford that he has his eye on Toronto and likes getting involved. And ultimately, He's someone who lost when he ran for mayor, but has a big influence. So we need someone who can stand up for the city of Toronto and make sure that our needs are prioritized and that our voices are heard. Lover and fighter, love that. Um, I have heard of uh, Doug Ford being referred to as the emperor of Toronto, um, even though we don't have that official title. Um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Strong mayor powers too, when the mayor is able to, you know, vote over council and get uh, required two thirds vote from council. That means even less representation because those city councillors are supposed to represent the constituents in their ward. So lots of concerns there. Great points. So Heather, no, and Nori next, what kind of uh, leader do we need? Um, I'm gonna uh, sort of speak to the, you know, Jennifer's talking to the to the national and provincial side and the relationship between the mayor and the province. Um, I want to speak to you know the flip side of having these sort of long drawn out arduous battles with Doug Ford is that you know the things that aren't supposed to be long arduous battles should be getting done faster, more efficiently, um, and with an eye on the prize so that more attention can be focused on also having those long arduous fights. So one of the things that is so striking when you look at the way that City Hall runs on a very granular level. So I was thinking of this specifically in terms of something like road safety, because I did an investigation on that last fall. Um, the amount of time it takes for councillors or the mayor to like, you know, approve um, like a stop sign being put in or for, you know, the a decision to be made on the ability to drink in parks, you know, or for the city to uh, enact its like cafe tio approval process. All of those things that are relatively, you know, they're 
they're things that we want, right? They're things we we need and we desire. Um, they're not that difficult. It's somehow we have made it excessively difficult. We have introduced like there's so many layers of, of bureaucracy. There's so much happening in terms of you know reports getting shuttled back and forth. And and once you have a committee, then uh, the committee does a report, and the report needs to go to a different committee for approval and Decisions that shouldn't be taking that long end up taking years, uh, years and years and years. Um, Ed Keenan uh, just wrote a column, I believe, today about the fact that um, a lot of places that have applied for CAFETO approval uh, are still waiting for those approvals to happen so that they can, you know, actually do what they're supposed to be doing this summer. And summers in Toronto and in Canada are really short. And the fact that um, it takes so long for this stuff to get done makes the city a harder place to live. And so I think having a mayor who is able to, you know, enact that sort of quicker, more efficient, less bureaucratic um, improvements uh, and be able to draw council together in a way that like inspires them to be moving quicker and making faster decisions, making decisions that are both well-informed um, and, and are listening to experts, but also, you know, don't take years of shuttling back and forth. Um, that would make the day-to-day -day living experiences in Toronto easier so that more energy can be afforded to the, the broader fights that we need to have on the provincial level. Um, so yeah, I just, I want to see more of that, that sort of spry, uh, energy-driven, inspiring, like motivational ability from a mayor rather than the complacency and, and slow, tiresome, uh, yeah, what we've, what we've seen so far. You don't want another study. <laughs> Or an updated study, because they did nothing with the study from three years ago, and now the data is old. So, yeah, this is exactly uh, great points. We uh, take for granted and almost get too used to the fact that things take so slow to enact, um, so that there really needs to be some changes there. Heather, what kind of leader do we need? Um, you know, I can only wholeheartedly agree with everything that has already been said. I think that everyone has already raised so many great points. Um, and maybe I can, you know, highlight some that I particularly agreed with. Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, it's really important that we have a mayor who understand, like not just understands the problems that Toronto is facing, but also understands what that means for people's lived experience and their effects on everyday life. I think, you know, when I look back at the mayors that we've had, they've tended to come from pretty privileged backgrounds. We haven't, you know, we haven't had a racialized mayor. We haven't, um, it's been a while since we had someone from an immigrant background. Um, you know, we, we've only had two women out of Toronto's 65 mayors. So like, there's clearly a lot of room for, um, you know, to have some um, different leadership. And I think that that's important for all the reasons that ha have already been mentioned. You know, these are more than just, the, the problems that we're facing are more than just you know, theoretical, right? They really impact people's everyday lives. I think the other thing is that, um, you know, they have to be savvy and creative, right? The problems that Toronto is facing are really complex. Um, we think about housing or environmental, climate change, uh, poverty, all of these things are, all of these are challenges that need to be met in the context of a really complex and changing political environment. So they're not things that the city can necessarily do on its own. It's going to take cooperation with, with the provincial government or with the federal government. And I think it's really important for the, the person to um, understand that context, particularly, you know, as we've already talked about in the, the context of a new strong mayor policies, which I think is not just about, you know, increasing the power of the mayor, but also the power of the provincial government over municipal politics. So someone needs to uh, maybe, I think the next mayor needs to figure out how to uh, leverage these powers and address key issues and advocate for Toronto with all also, you know, without antagonizing the provincial government, maybe. And then finally, I'd like to see some creativity when it comes to thinking about how funding, um, how programs and services that are needed to make this, make Toronto a good place for everyone to live, how that might take place. Like currently so much of our discussion is focused on property taxes, you know, and 
that makes sense. Property taxes are uh, a key source of funding for the city, and that's likely to remain so. But the city has other sources or potential sources of, of revenue that it hasn't used or stopped using. And for instance, um, the vehicle registration tax was repealed and never reintroduced. Other cities around the world have things like a municipal income tax. You know, that's not something we currently have the power to do in Ontario, but it's something I know that it's, has been discussed. So um, I, I, I fully understand why property taxes is such a, a focus for a certain group of people, but I also think like we, we need to, you know, think beyond that and think about other other possibilities. And I'd like to see those, I'd like to see those put on the table by the next mayor. That's great, Heather. And SPT often talks a lot about these other uh, revenue generating tools. And, I, you know, I've seen in this uh, election period more conversation about revenue than I've ever, ever seen. It was in the past really hard to get politicians to talk about it. Um, and just, you know, about a year ago, uh, council would vote down any uh, possibility of of increasing property taxes. They they increased in this past budget more than they ever have. But of course, you know, too little, too late. Um, so maybe we'll get more into that later on. So thank you all for that. And I also just want to note that we are getting a number of questions from the participants. So thank you all for sending Isra your questions. And we will get to those questions once we get through two more rounds of questions to our guest speakers. So next, we want to talk about the candidates' platforms. Um, and specifically, we want to ask our guest speakers, what are you listening for when you hear from candidates and when you review their platforms, as well as what do you think voters need to pay the most attention to when deciding on who to vote for? And we're going to turn to Inori first this time. Yeah, so I think in terms of, you know, what people need to be paying attention to the most um, it's really interesting to have 102 people running because it sort of becomes like the truth is that most of those people are, you know, there's there's no, very little chance that they will, you know, have a significant number of votes. And I, I sort of I think about the, the motivation around running. So, you know, in the broadest sense, if you're looking at all 102, it's interesting to think about why certain people think their name should be on the ballot, you know, what they feel they have to offer what they've done to engage with community and different communities uh, in a way that gives them the sort of experience and both professional and lived experience to be able to take on a role of this nature. Um, so I think about leadership history, uh, engagement with different communities, um, how long have they been thinking about acting on and talking about particular the issues that affect the city most, um, and you know how much of this is uh, an attempt to garner power or to, to you know, and getting a kick out of seeing your name on a ballot um, or, you know, how much of it is out of a genuine interest in improving the lives of, of people in the city. Um, I think that's, it's very easy uh, to, to make that differentiation between the sort of a lot of the candidates that you see. But then when you get into the, the history of, the, of the, some of the major candidates, I think that one of the biggest things is looking at the promises they make um, in their platforms in comparison to their actual histories, either in leadership roles uh, in, in the city in general or on council in particular. It's very handy to have people running who have been uh, on council so long that you can see their votes, you can see how they've chosen to act previously on certain subjects, um, on issues like housing and taxes and, um, you know, different choices around the budget and policing. Those indications of their professional histories um, and the decisions they've made in the past uh, are a really solid indicator of, you know, whether their platforms exist mostly to sound good, you know, or whether they have sort of the genuine backing to be able to, to hold up the things they, they promise now. Um, so that's what, that's what I, I look for most prominently, um, that sort of evidence that the things that they promise are things that they are actually going to be willing to do, even if it involves hard decisions, uh, once they get into the position of power. 
That's great. Thanks, Anori. And another plug for the Locals Candidate Tracker, which is such an excellent resource. And um, I'm loving the, the candidate profiles as well. You so far profiled Anna Balau and uh, Josh Matlow. So those are really, really helpful for voters to, to, to get a, dive a little deeper um, because you tend to hear the same things over and over again in the debates. So Jennifer, what are you listening for and what do you think voters should pay attention to? I'm listening for priorities and then the plans for those priorities. I know a lot of people get frustrated with the sound bites and the repetitive nature of politics, but those are the priorities. Listen, what are the candidates saying over and over again? What are they saying on radio? What are they saying on social media? What are they saying in the debates? Ultimately, that's their focus. And those are their, their priorities, the ones that they're sharing to get elected. And then what are the plans? Go to their website, try to get a sense of how they actually plan to fund that idea or how they're gonna get support for that idea. What's the timeline on that idea? I think there have been a lot of promises made in other election campaigns. Uh, also the election re-election of, of John Tory, Smart Track. We're Smart Track. And that was key to his election in, in 2014. And uh, this is a time to take note because whoever gets elected, it's up to the citizens as well as media to say, remember when you promised that, right? We have to hold the mayor and councillors to account, they work for us, don't forget that. We vote them in, they work for us. I agree completely, Nori, on voting records. And councillors, I highly recommend checking out City Hall Watcher by Matt Elliott. He always does a roundup of council votes. He'll also go back, screen grabs of, you know, the red, the green, who was there, who wasn't, and also former councillors. But if you weren't a councillor, you can still run for mayor. And some of the top candidates were an MPP or a minister or an MP. And again, there's an overlap when it comes to public transit, when it comes to housing, when it comes to a lot of these issues. And if you haven't been in office, I don't think that disqualifies you for running for mayor, but you can look at someone's resume. You can look at someone's social media over time. You can look at the endorsements. Are people just showing up for an issue right now? Or are they taking an issue that they voted against on council and now saying that they're going to lead? Uh, or are they actually saying, I've been talking about this for 10 years because they have been talking about it for 10 years. And it might seem overwhelming, but there are a few ways to do this research. One is read the local or the Toronto Star, CBC Toronto, City Hall Watcher, um, but also talk to people in your community. I always love when people reach out to me and they say, I know you're very involved in politics and I know you work as a journalist and I point people in directions so, so they can do that. But even a quick look at websites, right? Being in conversation, uh, the records are there, dig them up. The candidates are hoping you don't. That's great, Jennifer. And I'm going to ask one of my, oh, there you go. My uh, colleagues read my mind, uh, that plug into City Hall Watcher. I think they have both a free edition as well as a paid uh, edition and the paid one is well worth the money. Um, we know we're skirting around the issues. Well, we're talking deeply about the issues, but we're skirting around how the different candidates sit on these issues and how we would assess them on some of these things. But that these are some of the resources, City Hall Watcher and the local um, and the Star and CBC and others that you can turn to for the specifics. That's great. Heather, what are you listening for? And what do you think voters need to pay attention to? And, you know, maybe in the context of a complex relationship that uh, individual nations and first uh, in Indigenous communities have to electing a colonial mayor? Yeah, you know, um, I've always, I know there's a lot of different op opinions um, amongst Indigenous people. Some people are really um, adamantly against participating in colonial elections. Um, some people are, you know, much more uh, accepting of that and, and you know, run for office themselves. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to run for office, I think, but I think uh, for me, it's always been important to participate in um, the electoral process. Um, and, you know, I think more broadly speaking, you know, I'm really interested in how, you know, how nuanced candidates are in understanding pro problems. You know, I'm not looking for candidates who have easy answers, but really, you know, are they willing to talk about the different things that might be required to address problems or thinking about the limitations of what the, the city can do and the 
the the complications of the the context that they're working in and like where you know where the city might need to be advocating um and working with other orders of government but i think you know what i'm ultimately really interested in is the kind of visions that the candidates have for the city and i feel like overall that this has been a very much a problem focused election and that you know that makes sense we we're faced with a lot of problems right now um but the the kinds of solutions that candidates might be proposing they're not just about solving problems they're about community communicating a particular vision for the city like what is the city all about what are who are the people who make up the city um who's important and whose interests should be heard um and just as an example like when i hear candidates emphasizing things like crime and safety you know I think it's important to that we all live in a safe place. But on the other hand, if you understand our city as a dangerous place filled with dangerous people, like that definitely says something about, um, you know, what you think about Toronto and Torontonians. And, you know, personally, I don't believe people are fundamentally bad. I think crime occurs and safety becomes an issue when people are in crisis, whether it's economic crisis or mental health crisis, and they don't have the resources that they need um, to confront these crises. So I'm interested in hearing about how candidates think we can address these challenges, you know, all the things that we're facing as a city in a way that's going to offer respect and dignity for everyone, you know, including the people on the margins, as, as Debbie talked about earlier. That's great. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, I love that, that, you know, obviously we need to address the crises and the challenges, but what do they think the city could be? What is the vision? Um, and not just thinking about it as a problem to be solved or a series of problems. Love that. I also noticed that someone in the chat shared what they would like to see in the next mayor. So I welcome other folks, other participants to share in the chat what you'd like to see in the next mayor. I think that's a great question for all of us to be able to answer. One more question to our guest speakers and then we'll open it up for a Q&A period. So we'll try to wrap this part up fairly quickly so we can move to all of your wonderful questions that are popping up. So this last question, I'll start with Jennifer on this one. Voter turnout, as we discussed, is at an all time low. 29% of eligible voters turned out last fall. What do you think needs to change in order for residents to be more interested and engaged in all of this? And how can public trust be rebuilt? Jennifer. Oh, well, it's tricky because people were Tired pandemic, we saw that dropped voter turnout also in the provincial election, and it looked like John Tory is going to be reelected and that there wasn't going to be an incumbent who would take him out. So that was part of that low voter turnout. And now we have this special by election in summer, and we don't have the council races to get out the vote. So it's going to be hard as well. But two ideas ranked balloting. If people could vote for more than one candidate and feel they weren't wasting a vote or having to vote strategically, especially when there are so many candidates. I know there are a lot of citizens who are like, mm, I like to, I'm not sure what to do, or I like to support this person, but I like that idea. Also, internet voting. This is something that's becoming more mainstream. We do so much online. I think as long as vote is secure and protected, and we have the technology to do that, if we can make voting easier and more accessible, that can only help. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I just saw some information about mail-in ballots, and uh, it's kind of funny that we're still talking about that, um, and we don't have that online <laughs> ballot option at this, at this day and age with technology where it's at. Um, so next, I'm going to go to Heather. What do you think in terms of public trust and voter and engagement? Yeah, it, I think the interesting thing about voter turnout and talking about the election is I think for a lot of people, you know, the, the election day or the days of voting leading up to the, the final day of voting, this is one part of participating in civic life and people making their voices heard. I mean, if you look around, the city, there are countless residents associations, business, business improvement groups, community groups, all people who are working to advance the interests of residents. And I think, you know, people are actually really interested in what goes on in the city and they care a lot. Um, 
but I'm, I'm wondering, like thinking about how people then also might be feeling increasingly disenfranchised from municipal politics. You know, I'm hearing anecdotally that people are finding it more difficult to access city councillors and feel heard at city hall since the number of councillors was reduced. You know, each councillor is now representing twice as, as many people. And I think if people aren't feel like they're not being heard, they're going to feel disenfranchised. And if you're feeling disenfranchised, you're not going to come out on election day. And then I think the other thing speaks to, you know, something that we've already talked about, which is you know, if we look at the leadership in the past, they've tended to be male and they've tended to be white. And this doesn't reflect Toronto at all. Like we're one of the most multiracial, multicultural cities in the world. Um, and I think, you know, people feel that distance from their representatives. Again, they're feeling, they might be feeling disenfranchised to not come out. So I think having um, a mayor from, from a racialized background could change that. And then of course, there's all the things you can do to, to make voting practically easier as, as Jennifer had mentioned. But I think there are also like, you know, contexts that will help people to feel like, you know, not just that they can be heard, but they're gonna be listened to as well and understood and that's important. As you're talking about um, having a racialized mayor and, you know, you would think in a city like Toronto, we would be one of the first municipalities in the country to to have that. And I was just thinking about prior to Obama, how uh, Hollywood films used to depict a, a, a black president as the future. That's how you could tell it was a future. Um, and now, you know, the United States of America had a black president. Uh, so why is Canada so far behind? Debbie, do you want to talk to us about voter engagement and public trust? I thought you were going to ask me to talk about why Canada doesn't have a black president. I think that it's too. interesting. I, I think that it's interesting too. that as Torontonians, we think we're so progressive, and yet Calgary is now in its second racialized mayor. Um, one of the first things that struck me when the first polls, polls came out was that, wow, for the first time in Toronto political history, the front runners um, rep are representative of the city. Um, I think the top six, we had um, gender parity, um, we had um, racial parity, um, which, is, which, is, which is interesting. But since Jen, you passed, off, passed me and didn't allow me to comment on number three, um, I just briefly wanted to say that Toronto is so... Is <laughs> you so get double complex. time, Debbie. So, that Toronto is so, <laughs> so complex. You should have spoken up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I forget you'll eventually come to me. That to, The city is so complex and our issues are um, so large as we've been um, talking about that. Um, we we can't afford to have a mayor that's partisan. We need a we we need a mayor that um, we we need a we need a mayor that's able to work across differences. We need a, including um, ideology um, and 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 to and so to to that. And what I'm paying attention to is not only what the priorities are in terms of which communities um, interests they're taking into account, but how they how they conduct themselves. Um, during the debates, what they're saying about how it is that they're going to um, get their plans done. Um, so that's what I was going to talk about a bit more, but uh, I'll leave it there. Um, oh, the only thing in terms of in in even with the um, stronger mayor powers, and I and I keep reminding myself that the strong mayor powers only exists when it's it's at the priority of the province. Um, so I'm not sure that um, that we were looking for a mayor who remembers that they want to most equal when they're at, when they are a council um, and that they shouldn't abuse any sort of additional powers that they have. But in terms of this question in voter, voter turnout, I asked this colleague and friend of mine um, who is actually on, on the call um, about, um, about this question, right? Um, how do we be, rebuild trust? How do we get... Um, how did we end up here? And I want to read you what she what she said to me. She said, I am personally resentful about the fact that everything about Toronto, whether the whether it's the mayor's debate, media coverage, tourism, arts, are all focused in the area south of Eglinton, east of Jane Street, and west of Leslie. That for more than 20 years since amalgamation, Toronto still means only this very small geographical area. Not sure which wards have the lowest turnout, but she's in Ward 1, um, North Etobicoke, significant, significant racialized population, voted for Ford and continue to vote for, vote for the Ford um, 
family um, because those are the politicians that they see. Those are the politicians who show up um, at their events, um, and those are the those are the politicians who claim to have their best interests um, at heart. Um, people vote um, with their heart. I'm not sure that folks um, pay as much attention as some of us in this call to, to the issues. Um, I think people vote based on cultural name recognition. Um, people vote on people they see when they go, when, when, when there's something happening in their community and they see those people out there. People, people vote for folks who say hello to them when they're in the grocery store and whose name they just now recognize. Um, with 102 people on the ballot, I'm not sure how um, folks are going to do that. When I was driving from my mother's house in Thornhill the other day down Bathurst Street, and one of the one of the candidates had his name and the number that he thinks is going to appear on the ballot. And I think, oh, that's smart. That's one way to make sure that if people aren't paying attention and not remembering the name, I believe they'll say, oh yeah, it was number so-and-so um, that, that I was going to um, vote for. Um, so I think it's anyone's game. I, I think the, the system itself, the way it's being reported out, um, we based on polling, there are some candidates who've just gotten far more media attention um, than, than anyone else. And yet we know that there are candidates with great policy platform, right? I, I was listening to some of the conversations that happened at Black Vote Canada um, the other night, and one of the candidates talked about um, the Eglinton LRT and Little Jamaica, and the fact that um, the, the incoming um, council with the new mayor should be looking at a community trust, right? If, if Doug Ford can give a trust to Zama down on, down on at Ontario Place for 95 years, why not a land trust to small business owners on Eglinton West, right? So, 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 and and will that get out people on Eglinton West to vote? Maybe, but who's heard that? Unless you attended the um, Black World Canada debate, you would never know that these kinds of conversations about very local issues are happening. Um, so not sure I, I have the say in terms of how you rebuild trust other than we need politicians who show up day in and day out. There are some politicians like that at the provincial level, some at the municipal level who are constantly around, whether or not, at, not, not only at election time, um, who we know are truly um, care about community, um, don't show up only when cameras are around. And those are the folks uh, and those are the people I hope um, will eventually win on June 26th. But yes, I would love to see a racialized woman, I must tell you. Here, here. Thanks for that great insight, Debbie. I really feel sad about missing out on your insight on question number three. I just want to give you another opportunity to please oh, share. Oh, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. I said Can I just I ask you a little bit about whether you noticed much conversation about immigrants and refugees in the past? There, it is only in the last day. And I think this is because um, this candidate probably has been privy to conversations that we've been having about refugee claimants and in the shelter system. Um, some of you may know that the city of Toronto released a, a media advisory uh, earlier this week that refugee claimants um, who are not able to find um, space in our shelter will be sent off to the federally funded hotels. Well, there are no federally funded hotels for refugee claimants in the city of Toronto. Um, the city, the, the federal government is funding hotels for Ukrainian arrivals who are not refugees. They're um, displaced people um, that Canada is temporarily housing. Um, it shows you the disconnect in terms of the various levels of government um, that we have a growing um, refugee uh, claimant population. Many of them came through Quebec, uh, Lacan, before the government shut down that safer um, route for those seeking um, protection and asylum uh, here in Canada. And, but many of the folks, um, given the racism, given the xenophobia that we're seeing rising in Quebec, given the, um, the premier of Quebec uh, making lots of noise, the federal government started moving people into Ontario, um, but outside of the greater Toronto area. But people come where there are resources. People come where their local, where their cultural communities are based. People come where they believe that they have a chance at, at a job. Um, and so we are seeing a growing number um, of claimants coming into Toronto. And unfortunately, um, housing is really expensive. 
Um, they, when they come, even if they come through our airport, CBSA, um, Canada Border Services is referring them into our shelter system um, in Toronto. Um, the city has to um, address this issue. The city can't do this alone. It needs other levels of government to step up. The, even the city has been running a hotel for Ukrainians and the federal government is yet to step up to, to, to reimburse um, the funding to those hotels. So, so it, and it's interesting in the last day or so, I've only heard one candidate speak about the fact that we need to pay attention and the mayor, whoever they may be, need to pay attention to issues of refugee and refugee resettlement here in the city of Toronto as well. And I'm not speaking about those who are brought in by the government or private sponsors, but those who find their way on our shores um, as a way to claim asylum. And you must know that Canada is probably the, one of the most difficult places to get to. Our borders, we have oceans on three sides and we have the United States as our land border country. So very, very difficult to get to. So people, but desperate people do desperate things and they're landing on our streets here in Toronto. Our politicians, our councillors and our mayor needs to pay attention to that. And that includes ensuring that people are, have a place to sleep at night, but also being able to work with other, other levels of government so that the resources are coming in. We, I don't think any of us are forgetting that we have an over billion dollar hole in our budget, um, primarily because of the pandemic and shelter and housing um, issues. Thanks for that, Debbie. So finally, we're going to turn to Inori, make sure I don't miss anyone. And this last question around voter engagement and public trust. Yeah, I, I struggled a little bit with, you know, the what the the right answer, what, what the answer to this question would be. I think that it is so understandable for people to feel helpless because I think that most people can't really name a time recently where their mayor or their counselor has has done something like good quickly uh, and efficiently to serve them. I think that they're seeing a lot of the um, the the worst things that can happen in a city when a, a council struggles, uh, you know, cuts to transit are especially comes to mind. Um, but I think they're they're not really seeing the ways that, that mayors can do good, you know, things that, that improve and better the lives of, of people in the city. And so I think part of it is that whoever is elected next will have a responsibility to show the city how things can be done and that we can hope for better. And I think that it'll it takes it'll take time to to earn back voter trust. Um, I, I think about how like you know when you're if you're commuting two hours each way or like an hour and a half each way to like get to your job and then you have this exhausting job like re regardless of what sort of profession you work yeah. in and then you come home and you have a family to take care of perhaps you live in multi-generational housing and, and they're they're the needs of of you know several people your children aren't able to go to summer camp because there are no summer camps available left in the city and you know there's there's so many ways that people are bogged down by the dysfunction of the city on a day-to-day -day basis that like I can't ima imagine for a lot of these folks even having the time to sit and look at election profiles and platforms um, and it'll take being shown that a better city is possible to regain that trust um, and I think yeah I think that'll just have to be you know that'll ha ideally have to happen over the next four years um, and then I think it's part of a sort of broader anxiety that I definitely see amongst, you know, my generation, I'm in my 20s, I, I look around at a lot of the people who are my age and were affected by the pandemic and who are losing a lot of their sense of, you know, we are responsible for each other as residents of the city that like, we owe things to each other, you know, there's, um, there's a sense amongst a lot of people today that like, oh, I don't know anyone anything like the thing that matters most is like that I'm getting what I need. And I worry a lot about that. And I think in the way that we respond to, you know, the, the, the idea of like the lack of public safety on transit, for example, you know, we see people who are, who we perceive as different or as threats and we recognize people as, you know, being deserving of our care because we live in the city together and we share the city. And so I worry a lot about that feeling because I think that's happening worldwide. I think it is a, a product of being so isolated for, for three years and also, you know, of, of, of several things going wrong in society at once. Um, and so I think there's a much broader practice that needs to happen um, amongst people in terms of like continuing community building and continuing to have like networks 
with strangers and with, you know, not just with people who are exactly like them or who are their friends, but with strangers, with people who we encounter on the street or on transit every day to remember that we share the city and we are the ones who can also make it better together, um, especially in the absence of, of strong, good leadership. Uh, and so I really hope that something, that things happen to like motivate people to, to remember that we all owe each other that care. That's lovely, Anori, and this actually is a nice segue into one of the questions that I see, and I'll, I'll just speak briefly to this piece that you're talking about, how you've seen a shift, and I think early in the pandemic, we saw a lot of messaging around, you know, if one of us gets sick, it impacts all of us, we're all in this together, we're all impacted by this, and and then as you saw some of the restrictions go away and some of the, the protections um that we relied on government to kind of ensure went away, it became a situation of each of us out to protect our own families. And I'm, I've been thinking a lot about how that's impacting us going forward. And I see one of the participants um, asking about our, our rights in communities, not just our, um, our rights, but our responsibilities, that it's as citizens, as people, residents of Toronto, that we expect things from our politicians, but we also, you know, what should we expect? From each other to contribute to a, a, a more healthy and harmonious city. So do any of you other than Anori want to just speak to what we need in the city, whether led by leaders or each other, to kind of bring back that we're here to support each other and we're not all in this just for protecting our own families? I'm happy to kick that off. I think for me, that comes back to voting. So I had a friend who was running for school board trustee and I went door to door. I don't have kids. The candidate did not have kids and some people would answer the door school board trustee i don't have kids and we'd say wait wait we don't either but don't you think we should have strong public schools where are we going to get doctors nurses teachers right don't you want to have access to community spaces and we made the case for why you should care about public schools even if you don't have a kid who is going to school and similar, when I am voting for mayor, I'm not just voting for myself, I'm voting for my neighbors, I'm voting for the seniors, I'm voting for the newcomers. But I think we all have to have this conversation because we have become a rugged individualist society. And yeah, we saw that shift during, during the pandemic, but I think we're part of making that case in every election and in that community engagement, whether it's going to a meeting that someone has invited you to or just going to the coffee shop and hearing someone complain and joining that rant and saying, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I'd love to figure out a plan. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else want to speak to this one before we move on? I don't see anyone unmuting. So we, of course, have to ask a question around housing because that's been one of the top issues and one of the, the biggest crises facing our city. So there's a few questions uh, from our participants about housing, I'm going to try to combine them and get you to speak to the different platforms, um, what different candidates are saying about affordable housing, affordable for whom, how they're approaching the term affordable, as well as just making sure that that housing is really for people who are in need for renters, that we don't see more Airbnbs out there. So who wants to go first talking about housing? Um, I'll start, Debbie. Um, it was, it's interesting. I mean, in terms of um, all of the leading candidates, I believe, um, and I'm sure others who I haven't heard from, um, housing is, is the number one issue. Houselessness um, is, is, the number, is the number one issue. Um, my concern is that they all, even some of our progressive um, or centrist uh, candidates, um, all have various understandings of what this whole notion of affordability means. Um, a bit disappointed that I haven't heard more discussion um, from, from some from some front, some of our front uh, runners around co-op housing, as an example, around um, really bringing community back into working together, building together. And this goes back to, to the question before that Jennifer just responded to, um, working together, because that's also a way for community development, community building to happen, is when there is a common interest. Um, we often see a real pushback um, from communities when they hear 
that deep housing has been developed, you should know I sit on the board of Toronto Housing. So I, I hear I hear quite a lot. Um, but but we need we need we need to be able to um, be, have people um, become excited again about growing their communities, about diversifying their communities. So we've lost the conversation that the best communities are communities that are mixed housing, that have housing that with rent geared to income, that have single family housing, that have multi-generational housing, that have you know, short story housing, large um, rental, rental towers that have single family um, homes. That's not only um, where the owners live, but also that are rented out to multiple families. We, we need all of that, all of that kind of mix of housing to build um, vibrant communities. And, and the city has to play a leading role in that in terms of working with the other levels of government in terms of pooling um, funding, but bringing communities, bringing community organizations, working with the nonprofit community housing organizations to help them acquire land, to, to help them walk through um, the process, the development process, so that they're building, they're building housing that is responsive to the, to the housing needs of the communities. Thanks so much, Debbie. Anyone else want to speak to this one? Yeah, um, if I if I could add, um, and and I agree with again with everything that Debbie was just was talking about. Um, I guess like I think housing is so important, and it's it's I'm glad to see it as one of the key issues because it's it's key, right? If you don't have secure, affordable housing, nothing else is going to be working out for you, right? It's like the the one of the the core needs that we have as people is as, as a stable place to live. And so I think that means that housing is and um, access to housing is much more than a supply problem, right? If it was just a supply problem, we could build more condos and the, the problem would be fixed. But we have condos up to here and we still have this problem of, of, of houselessness and access to, to housing. So we have to think about all of the other parts of that, right? It's like the the tenant protection issue, I think, is huge, right? Because that's something that has been continuously eroded in Ontario over the past few years. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an issue of wages and of income support, and I think it's also, you know, there are environmental considerations to be to be making as well. They could be part housing could be part of of addressing um, sustainability and you know, the, the city's commitments to sustainability and, and net zero targets. So, um, you know, I think looking at how the candidates are addressing the nuances of the problem is really important. So the housing problem is really important. And if the, I think if they're, you know, they're offering easy answers to me, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, maybe a red flag, like let's look a little bit more closely at what what the substance of these these promises actually are. Heather, do you want to just speak a little bit to um, your perspective around Indigenous urban planning and what you'd like to see in Toronto? Because I think very few people are familiar with that area of work. Um, I guess one of the things that I have focused on a, a lot is how um, how urban development and municipal planning decisions affects Indigenous communities. A lot of my work has focused on kind of the, the urban, um, exurban borders and margins. So what, what happened, like, and, and this is relevant, although maybe not directly to the mayoral election, but it's definitely relevant to mayoral politics, urban politics and, and housing development. Like what happens when one of the answers to the problem of housing in Ontario is to, to build on the green belt and build into areas where there are outstanding land claims and where there are, um, you know, land, areas of, um, significance for indigenous people, right? And those areas that have not been developed are fewer and fewer. So the potential for conflict and the potential there to infringe on Aboriginal treaty rights is really, really quite large. And that needs to be part of the discussion when we're talking about addressing housing, I think. But also, of course, if we look at the people who are most acutely suffering from 
houselessness and experiencing homelessness, um, th there are a lot of Indigenous people in that population. So thinking about, you know, not just um, providing temporary shelter or, you know, access to affordable housing is important, but thinking about the roots of those problems, like how is structural racism contributing to this? Um, that's another part of, you know, a nuanced, I think, uh, approach to thinking about housing. I hope I said enough. <laughs> that was helpful. Thank you for that overview. Uh, Inori, I saw that you unmuted earlier. Did you want to speak around affordable housing? Oh, uh, everyone covered the points that I think needed to be made. I think the one thing I would just add is that um, I think that there is something really valuable also in looking to other models that have worked in, in cities around the world. Um, I'm always surprised that I don't hear more about what we could learn from, from other cities uh, in terms of you know, st structures of, of accessible and affordable housing and the ability to, to provide housing to people through, you know, social housing and, and co-ops, as, as Debbie mentioned, there's so little uh, attempt to innovate and to learn from evidence-based approaches uh, in different cities around the world. I've only heard like one person mention, I think briefly the the Vienna model in their in their platform of social housing. And so, yeah, I think there's so much to be learned from from looking at what's working elsewhere. Um, and I hope that more of that happens um, as we get closer to to election day and to think beyond the sort of confines that we've we've roped ourselves into at this point. That's great. Thanks, Anori. So this next question is from Felix. Are indigenous land back claims of relevance to mayoral candidates? Or are they solely federal issues? Are these claims less likely to fall between the cracks, thus worsening the homelessness and poverty of this dispossessed segment of society? Who wants to take that? I don't want to assume, Heather, but it looks like you unmuted. <laughs> I mean, I can start and I have to say I be um, I haven't looked closely at every candidate, so I'd be curious to hear um, maybe from Anori if it is something that comes up. Um, you know, I, I think I, don't, I think you know the Felix sounds like he knows what he's talking about because it's like a it's a question that a complicated question with a complicated answer. I think if I can if I can summarize like. And answer quickly. I think you know certainly that is um, the danger that uh, indigenous issues will be pushed to the side because traditionally they have been thought of um, as a purely a federal issue is you know always a danger. I think um, you know the, the city has made these commitments in the form of the the reconciliation action plan. Um, which is, you know, by far um, not fully addressing all of the, the um, issues and demands that might be associated with the land back movement, but still a good start. And I think for the first time, really putting this on the map and on the table as an important um, city priority, right? And it's something that can be addressed across many areas of policy making. I think um, like so much when it comes to talking about reconciliation across Canada, like there's a real danger that that just becomes a form of like, you know, everything else when we when we talk about issues, like whether it's greenwashing or, or pinkwashing or whatever, that it becomes the thing that people have to mention, but um, you know, there's not a lot, necessarily a lot of action. So, I mean, that's why I think it's important for, for our leader our leaders to take this seriously and to continue action on it so that it doesn't become you know, just empty words again. Thanks, Heather. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next question unless anyone wants to jump in. Okay, great. That was a great question. And I, you know, we were, um, when the, uh, the encampments were being so violently cleared, uh, we were also thinking about how such a significant um, population of the unhoused in Toronto are indigenous. And what does it mean when you are displacing an indigenous person off, out of a park uh, on colonized land? It's so, so complex. I will just say really quickly to, to Heather's point, um, I haven't actually seen 
any like interesting engagement with land back in any of the candidates platforms it's, it's so you know important that it's been brought up i'm really glad i think that um at most i i see these sort of like you know general like signaling towards you know buzzwords like reconciliation um but it doesn't feel like a lot of people have given it deep thought and so um yeah i i love the discussion that's happening here um and i wish there was more of it on the candidate stage it'd be great to see more of that Here's the next question. So um, strong mayor powers. Uh, the majority of council don't always support progressive policies and investments. Are there situations where you think it would be okay for the next mayor to use the strong mayor powers? This might be something you all have an opinion on if you want to speak to it. Who wants to go first? Debbie. Yes, if only that that is how they would use it. Uh, when I think about building um, housing in areas um, where wealthy folks um, don't want uh, social housing uh, or public ho public housing or deeply affordable um, housing to be built. We have a number of um, councillors from Etobicoke, from some parts of, of East York, from some parts of um, Scarborough who are constantly pushing back um, again against um, support for communities and for marginalized communities um, if only the strong mayor powers if only we can say the mayor can only use strong mayor powers if it helps the, mar the most marginalized in our communities i'll be all for strong mayor powers um, i think we run the risk of, uh, of of someone using strong mayor's powers to uh jam through um, pro-development um pro-rich people rich people's agenda. Um, I don't mean to be crude um, about it, but that, those are the words that come to me. Um, I think our default tends to be to be that. Um, I, I don't trust I don't trust it though. I don't trust that um, the person in that position wouldn't use the power um, if if it meant that they were curry favoring um, with the with the political powers at Queen's Park right now. And I believe that the province only gave those powers because um, we have a premier who wants to control um, Toronto and wants to control Toronto both um, with the leaders he already has um, provincially, but also now um, by, by, by placing um, his person in that seat with the powers that they can um, do his bidding here in the city of Toronto. Um, and that's a scary thought. So building on that in 2018, I attempted to run for city council, but then in the middle of the election, council was cut in half. Yeah. So I was in a new riding and then it didn't exist. And I ended up in a court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. We lost by one vote. But what I learned, because it came up and over and over again, is that Toronto is a creature of the province. So the premier could actually appoint a new mayor. And that's the sad reality of all of this is the province yep. has a lot of power and this premier has a particular interest in, in Toronto. So strong mayor powers, depends who's the mayor. Yeah, and but when we saw that, right, even when we had a progressive premier, I remember um, talk, talking about the municipal vote for immigrants um, as an example, which hasn't come up by the way in this election, which is interesting. Um, and we had Kathleen Wynne um, as the premier and we got, we were able to get the vote through city council that said yes to um, extending the vote to immigrants. We always joke that the Ford brothers voted for it because they didn't really understand what the motion um, was about. But anyways, we got both their votes and, and this, and then we were able to get another six municipalities from around the province. And we went to the, to the premier with this and nothing. Um, they went ahead and, and pushed through rank ballots. Um, the two things went to the province at the same time, and they didn't follow through with granting the, the immigrants the vote. So, um, yeah, uh, but but yeah, the province really can do whatever they want with the municipalities because, you know, we exist at the pleasure of the province, as Jen said. Absolutely. Heather and Nori, do you want to speak to strong mayor powers at all? It's been said. Yeah point yeah the question is not just do the ends justify the means but would the province actually allow because there is that clause as debbie said earlier it has to align with provincial priorities um here's one last question and then we'll wrap up so post-election what do you hope to see from our new mayor in the first few months of their term anybody have any thoughts on that one I think that um, I would love to see tangible and 
like deeply like moving examples of the mayor actually engaging with the people of the city because I feel like that's something that's left to sort of election season and it seems like as soon as they've won it's it that's it that's the hard part done and and everything else is just like cushy for the next four years and I I feel the sense that yeah like I, I would love to to see a mayor who I feel is like genuinely present in communities as has been said previously um and yeah who doesn't sort of take the role for granted once they've they've gotten it um I don't know how that would how that would look in real time um but yeah it, it seems like in the past especially with the problem of incumbency and the fact that so many incumbents get re-elected re uh it's just about maintaining power um and I'd like to feel like this mayor isn't just wanting to do that thanks Nori any other final thoughts on that piece um I will just point to Bob's comment in the chat about why is no one talking about the largest landlord in the city, Toronto Community Housing. I don't know if any of you want to speak to that. Inori, did you see any platforms touching on TCH and or the social housing waitlist? Yes, there have been some points on on TCH. There's been uh, you know proposals to create like new uh, city departments. Um, to help with uh, building sort of supportive housing and uh, and uh, so, uh, social housing to alleviate the strain um, on TCH and the waitlist. Um, and a few of those plans are costed and um, have sort of full planned out budgets behind them, proposals for, for specific streams of revenue, um, and are realistic about the the amount of money that would take uh, and the, the value of that investment and the need for that investment. So I do feel like there's been uh, some discussion about it. I worry, again, as with all things, that once that discussion takes place and the person is elected, that will no longer materialize. Like it, it was a, primarily a proposal for the election season. And so um, I'm really hopeful. I think some of the like the, I think one of the biggest things is just innovative revenue streams, right? The ability to create targeted revenue streams to be able to fund the things that need to be funded. Um, and I'm seeing plans where, you know, there is uh, integrating streams of funding from federal levels that don't involve like asking the government to pitch in, but more involve like, uh, you know, federal loans and, and uh, you know, low interest loans from the um, Canada Mortgage and Housing uh, Co Corporation. Uh, so there are new ideas in circulation from some of the major candidates. Um, and I think the most important thing to think about uh, when you see a new idea is, are they providing a, an, an insight into where that funding is going to come from? So that's something to keep in mind. That's great. Thanks, Inori. And um, we're having an upcoming uh, newsletter that's uh, that'll be released shortly where we'll talk about some of the revenue tools. There's been quite a bit of discussion about it. We have lots of City Budget Watch blog posts about revenue tools as well. So I'm just going to ask a closing out question uh, from each of our guest speakers, and I'll ask you to keep it to a minute long because we're wrapping up. Um, any insight into how we motivate the public to get out to vote so we get above that 30% threshold this time around? Jennifer, do you want to go first? The studies show if you have a plan to vote, you are most likely to vote. So if you have a plan to vote, talk about it. Bring a kid, tell your neighbors, mention it at work. Some of you may convince someone else how you want them to vote, but even if we just keep people out to vote, remind people advanced voting, voting, and that it's your right. We have so many people who have come to Toronto from around the world where they don't have easy access to a free and fair vote. And I think this is a right that so many people fought for and we continue to fight for. So spread the word and really encourage folks. I mean, I, I'm shameless. I'll say, you know, if I bump into a friend on election day, before we continue this conversation, have you already voted? Polls are open for another, you know, yeah, yeah, I have. Or, uh, But I, I think we really have to talk about it like anything else we value is say, what's your plan? Come with me. Come with me. We can go now. Sounds great. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm promoting, I'm promoting advanced voting. Um, I need to be out of the country for a funeral on election day and I have to vote in advance poll. So that's my new mantra. I'm also sharing the news. I'm excited in the way I haven't been excited about an election in a very, very long time. And so I'm having this conversation, right? For the first time we get to vote for someone who's never sat in this mayor's chair before. 
um, we have we have a group of people who are running who for the first time resemble the 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 the, the uh, resemble the the people who live in Toronto. Um, we have mixed race folks running. We have uh, gender. Um, we have sexual orientation, although people don't come out. Um, so get out and vote um, has been my message. And polls, advanced polls are open. Go out and vote this weekend is is what I've been saying. I'm gra I'm dragging my 26 year old daughter with me tomorrow morning to go vote. So there you go. Love it. And, you know, this is an opportunity where you can vote anywhere in the city. So maybe it's a fun opportunity to visit a different part of the city and vote from there. That's great. Heather. Yeah, I'm a big fan of advanced voting because there's not usually a lineup. It's really easy. Um, so I'm planning to vote tomorrow and I'm going to tell everyone about how easy it was and encourage them to go do it. Great. And Ori? Um, I feel like everyone has friends in the city that they probably haven't seen in a long time. So my proposal is uh, catch up while you wait in line, uh, grab your friends who you haven't talked to in a while, uh, get a big group together, make it a party, uh, get everyone to vote, catch up while you're waiting in line, and then go get dinner or coffee or go hang out at someone's house. Like, make it fun. Like, democracy can be fun. So I think that we should consider it as such. And I uh, think it's a good opportunity to reconnect with our city and each other. That's great. I love that idea. Grab a coffee and wait in line with your friends. And I love this feeling of fun and hope um, and excitement about the election. I agree. It is very exciting. Despite the difficult situation that our city is facing, um, there's lots of hope right now. Lots of hope for change. So thank you so much, Debbie, Heather, Jennifer, and Nori for your wonderful insight, your brilliant insight. It was such an honor and a privilege to be able to moderate this conversation with all of you. I hope we can stay connected moving forward. Thank you everyone to all your questions. Wonderful questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them all. And if you wanna engage with SBT on those questions, let us know. We have lots of resources. I don't wanna go into all the details of the resources, but I do wanna point your uh, attention towards our show up TO campaign. Let's get out to vote. Let's get our friends out to vote. Let's commit to getting folks out. Let's show up and show we care about our city and make sure we get the mayor that we want, that we deserve, that that will help us create the city that we, we really, really need in this moment in time. We have lots of election resources on our website. Please take a look at our fact sheets, all our partners events, different campaign platforms. Um, we'll have the locals campaign tracker there. If you don't remember that we have info on advanced voting so please take a look at our website um, and I just want to say thanks again to our guest speakers thanks to all of you the ASL and manual captioning team to the SBT team that organized this event um, and the Toronto Foundation for their support for our voter engagement activities as well as our core funders United Way Greater Toronto and the City of Toronto so friends we get a do-over Let's make this count. Vote for our next mayor. Choose wisely. And happy Pride, happy Indigenous History Month. Thank you and have a good night. I'm releasing you five minutes early. Thanks, everyone.